What do you call a group of cats? Oh, let me check on that. It's called a clouder of cats. If you have a question, any question, there's a number you can call. 917-275-6975. And a librarian at the New York Public Library will try to answer it for you. Hello, thanks for calling Ask NYPL. We have 10 librarians on the team and we answer any question that you may have over the telephone. In the office today, we have Matthew, Bernard, Serena, Diane, and me. Our department, Ask NYPL, began in 1967. We started answering questions over the telephone, but people have been reaching out to librarians for as long as there have been libraries. The New York Public Library has actually saved records of some of the more interesting questions they've been asked over the years. Like, is there a full moon every night in Acapulco? Why do 18th century English paintings have so many squirrels in them, and how do they tame them so they wouldn't bite the painter? Are Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates one and the same person? In a world of Google, it's a bit surprising to know that they get around 30,000 calls per year. My question is, why? Um, oftentimes, people might not have access to the technology at home, and I honestly think some just want somebody to talk to. So the next time you have a question, like, how many teeth does a great white shark have? You can call this number. 917-275-6975. That'll ring inside of this building, up on this floor, and maybe Bernard or Rosa will pick up, and they'll answer it for you. They have about 300 serrated teeth. This library is full of historic treasures. The Trinity Library in Dublin, Ireland was founded in 1592. Its most famous area is the Long Room. This 213-foot room houses 200,000 of the library's oldest books. The room is lined with marble busts, many of great philosophers, writers, and people who supported the college. The Long Room is also home to one of the last remaining copies of the 1916 Proclamation of the Irish Republic, the Trinity College Harp, which is from the 15th century, and the Book of Kells, an illuminated manuscript of the Four Gospels that is from the 8th century. It is the largest library in Ireland, and as a copyright library, it can obtain books and materials published in Ireland for free. It is the only library in the country to hold this right. In Spring Green, Wisconsin, there is a house on a rock. But it is so much more than that. Inside, it is home to many bizarre and incredible collections. There's a room of self-playing instruments, an infinity room, a giant squid attacking a whale, and some nightmare-inducing dolls. It seems like a really strange museum, and that's because... No. <laughs> um, it, it appears to be a museum because it is housing antiques, it's housing all kinds of memorabilia and things from a different era. It's more of a place to just enjoy. So, what is House on the Rock? The House on the Rock to me is a magical complex. It's an all-around sensory explosion. It was made by Alex Jordan, who was an architect? Not at all, not at all. He is not a trained man. He's just a man of great vision. Maybe not an architect, but an evident hoarder. Alex Jordan, with the help of his friends, built the House on the Rock in the 40s and opened it to the public in the 60s. His collections of antiques and junk, new items and old, real and quite obviously fake, have no central theme or apparent reason for being there and maybe that's part of its charm. There are some pretty incredible things, including a huge, unrideable carousel. 269 different animals, not one of them is a horse. 
Really? Yes, the horses adorn the walls. Of course they do. You know, every time you turn the corner here, it's a different thing and it's a different wow and you don't know what to expect. One man's trash is another man's roadside tourist attraction. In southern Pennsylvania, there is a battlefield. A battlefield so important that it is thought to be the turning point of the American Civil War. This is a story about that place. It's also a story about cats. Thousands and thousands of little cats. This is Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca. And this is her twin sister, Ruth. Hi, I'm Ruth, and we run a museum of dioramas that are made with handmade Civil War cats. Civil War cats. The combination of a childhood love for clay cats and a strong fascination with the American Civil War. It started out as a hobby that we just did as kids putzing around in our bedrooms. That bit of child's play led to a full-fledged museum, which opened in 2013. The two of us discussed how much do we want to emphasize the cat thing, because we don't want to come off as cutesy cats. The idea is the stories of the men, not so much the fact that they're cats. They just are cats because they're cats. Incredibly, each of these scenes is to scale. One eighth of an inch equals one foot in cat feet. And so each one of our soldiers represents one soldier who would have been on the field. We'll calculate the numbers that would have been left in the regiment and we'll fill it in with that many cat soldiers. So for example, Little Round Top, we're going to eventually have about 5,000 soldiers on it. Typically one like the angle we figure took us about four and a half years. The um, Little Round Top diorama we figure is more of a five or six year diorama. Oh look <laughs> We really just want to make the Civil War more approachable, I guess, for people, so they can relate to the history and have more of a connection with the men and the women involved. Now that the word of this cat museum's out, all the people who love cats come in, and now not only are they seeing our dioramas and falling in love with the five and a half thousand little furry smiles smiling at them, but they're also learning the stories and suddenly they have an appreciation of Gettysburg and the history just because they came to see the cats. In the 80s, when lots of people were playing arcade games like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, and Frogger, this is what they were playing in Soviet Russia. There is about 50 different kinds of Soviet games, most of which are working. That's Alexander. He runs the Museum of Soviet Arcade Machines in St. Petersburg, Russia. Приходя в наш музей, посетитель получает горсть настоящих советских монет, с помощью которых автоматы запускались 25 лет назад. И вот это возвращение в 80-е происходит у нас с помощью вот тактильных ощущений и всего, что посетитель видит. Unlike their Western counterparts, the games weren't just for fun. С точки зрения разработчиков советских игровых автоматов были сделаны попытки сделать автоматы, которые не, скажем так, развлекают, а развивают. Это тяжело и и достаточно бессмысленно. The point of the games was training for the Soviet Army, building skills like reasoning, hand-eye coordination, and marksmanship. В 1975 года в Советском Союзе начали выпускать игровые автоматы. Велосипед придумывать уже не нужно было, брали самые популярные автоматы, немного упрощали их из-за вставания в электронике, поэтому в советских игровых автоматов нет памяти на очки, нет как бы, соревнования с предыдущими игроками. All the Soviet arcade games were built in military factories, using leftover parts from weapons, refrigerators, calculators, and other items. То есть это точно такие же развлекательные, спортивные, какие-то стрелковые военные автоматы, что и во всем мире, просто немножечко адаптированы к российским, советским реалиям. 
But now, decades after the fall of the Soviet Union, four-year-old boy and five-year-old in our museum are spending time wonderfully. He doesn't associate himself with the Soviet Union. It's just interesting to play. Now, in 1989, when they first do it, they go, wow, this is fun. I am Buzz Frank Perry. I am the proprietor of Buzzarama, the slot car racing center of the world. Slot car racing is a hobby sport that's participated in all over the world. In 1965, it was my hobby. I was one of the first to open in New York. There was 48 places like this in the city. Today, I'm it. I'm the lone survivor. They have 12 volt DC motors in them and a guide flag that fits in the slot. And when you hit the hand controller, it energizes those lanes and gives the motor juice. The fastest cars can go upwards of 100 miles an hour. So they're like blurs now. You have to hear them. Yo, wing, wing. Can you hardly see them? You have to listen to them. You go, wow. Kids play with computer now, and there's no interaction with anyone. Over here, they have interaction with other drivers. They compete, they congratulate each other. You learn sportsmanship. It's really great. Just watching the cars go around the tracks pumps up your adrenaline and you get all excited and that, that thrill never leaves you. You always think about it. In Guanajuato, Mexico, there is a museum filled entirely with mummies. Mi nombre es Paloma Robles Lacayo y soy la directora del Museo de las Momias de Guanajuato. El Museo de las Momias de Guanajuato es un recinto sagrado que exhibe una colección de momias naturales. With 117 bodies in total, the museum has the largest collection of natural mummies in the world. The mummies are the well-preserved remains of people who died during a cholera outbreak in Mexico in the 1800s. The museum is a haunting and eerie experience for visitors, an opportunity to stare death in the face. Vienen a buscar esa experiencia íntima, ese encuentro místico con la muerte, que propicia la reflexión en torno a la intensidad de su propia vida y el sentido de la misma. Es importante que las personas no le tengan miedo a la muerte y al contrario, lo vean como un fenómeno natural, como una transición inevitable de su existencia, porque finalmente se van a encontrar con ella. <risa> 